So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the viscosity of fluids. Now, ideal fluids, which is what we've dealt with so far, have, we've assumed that the molecules in them can slide by each other without any force of friction. And so we can say that they have zero resistance to a shear stress. If you try to apply a shear stress to an ideal fluid, there'll be immediate fluid flow and no more shear stress. However, real fluids don't behave like that and they have a resistance to these shear stresses. And this resistance we call dynamic or shear viscosity. And it's the reason why something like honey is a lot uh, uh, stickier and a lot more syrupy than something like water. If you pour water out of a uh, container, it will run quickly. If you pour honey, it runs a lot more slowly because the molecules in the honey have a friction as they slide by one another. Now, in general terms, viscosity is a very complicated and complex quantity, and it's actually a tensor quantity. We're not going to deal with that here. What we're going to concentrate on is perhaps one of the most common types of viscosity or one with the most common applications, and that is dynamic or shear viscosity. So let's have a look at how we define this dynamic or shear viscosity uh, using a diagram on the computer. So what we have here are two plates. So this is the first plate, and this is the uh, second plate here, shown in sort of brown. And sandwiched between them is a, uh, a fluid that has a resistance to shear stress. So this fluid has a shear viscosity. So what happens is if you move the top plate and you give it a velocity, so we're going to move the top plate, and we give it a velocity u, right? So this is our velocity. Then if this is an ideal fluid, then it has no resistance to shear uh, stress at all, and so of course this will be essentially a frictionless surface. This plate will move without any problems whatsoever. But real fluids have a resistance to shear um, stress, and this gives rise to the shear viscosity. And so you can see here that we are causing a shear stress on this uh, fluid, and that produces a drag force here on the top plate. And so what we have is that this drag force is proportional. Well, it's going to be proportional to the area of the plate. So this is the uh, area A of the plate uh, we've got here. So it's going to be proportional to A because you can imagine if you increase the area of the plate, you're increasing the area of contact, and that's going to generate a larger drag force. Um, it's also going to be proportional to the velocity. Now why it's proportional to velocity and not the velocity squared, um, that I'm not going to explain here. It just turns out that it is proportional to the velocity. So the faster you're going, the larger the drag force. And then, as you would imagine, then the larger this thickness is, the, the more fluid there is between these two plates, the easier it's going to be to move this top plate because as we've seen with shear stress, if you remember with shear stress, it's the extension um, in the parallel direction that was here divided by the uh, uh, perpendicular dis distance here. So the thicker this layer of liquid is, the smaller the shear stress is going to be, and so therefore the um, less drag we're going to get. So it's going to be inversely proportional to the thickness. So what we need now is we need a constant of proportionality, and that is going to be our viscosity. And we use the symbol eta, and so we say that this drag force is equal to eta times the area times u over y, where u is the velocity and y is the uh, separation between the two plates, and this is the viscosity. So next question is, well, what are the uh, units for this? Well, obviously, here on this side of the equation, we need uh, newtons. Um, here we've got meters squared. Um, here we have uh, meters per second. And here we have um, meters. So what this, these uh, three quantities give us essentially uh, meters squared per second. 
and so the units for viscosity are going to have to be newtons seconds per meters squared and so that is the SI unit for viscosity. Now there is a non-SI unit called the uh, poise and one poise with a capital P is equal to 0 0.1 newton seconds per meter squared and so this is a uh, this is actually the CGS system so centimeters grams and seconds um, and so it's out by a factor of 10 uh, from what we want for the SI unit so we don't use this unit I'm not going to use it uh, but you may see it mentioned in which case you need to know that it's a unit of viscosity and is equal to 0.1 uh, SI units which are Newton seconds uh, per meter squared so despite the fact they felt it was worthwhile coming up with the name Pascal for Newtons per square meter uh, they haven't decided yet that it's worth coming up with a name for newton seconds uh, per meter squared. So that's our definition for shear or dynamic viscosity. So what we're seeing here is the effect of viscosity on a velocity profile. So this is a velocity profile for fluid in a pipe. So this is our um, ideal fluid where there is no viscosity. And so in an ideal fluid where there's no viscosity, it's frictionless essentially. So you can think of planes of molecules here moving by one another with zero friction both between themselves and with the pipe surface. Right? So it's a frictionless uh, uh, motion and so there is no velocity difference between different uh, points in the fluid. This velocity is going to be constant everywhere. Now notice this is different to when we were talking about turbulent and laminar flow. You can still have laminar flow of a viscous fluid. Laminar flow is defined that the velocity at a single point does not change with time. In an ideal fluid, the velocity is the same at all points in space and constant with time as well, or at least at a particular cross-section. Obviously the velocity may change if this pipe widens or, or narrows. So, but if we look at the flow through the pipe, um, where the pressure is the same and the uh, width of the pipe is the same, then the velocity all the way across the pipe, shown by the size of these arrows here, is constant because there's no frictional rubbing between the moving planes of fluid. This is a viscous um, fluid. Oops. So here we have eta not equal to zero. And what you can see is you can see this parabolic profile of um, fluid velocity. So the velocity here, at these points here, the velocity is actually zero. And the reason for that is that the molecules that are in contact with the uh, surface wall uh, stick to that wall and uh, do not move. But they, the molecules then next to them, will slide by them. But because this is a viscous fluid, there is now a frictional force. And so the speed difference between the molecules touching the wall, which is zero, and then the ones that are a little bit in, they will move, but as we saw, remember that our drag force was equal to the friction times the cross-sectional area times the velocity divided by the thickness. So if we divided this uh, uh, fluid into uh, thin little narrow strips, then what would happen is that our uh, initial fluid velocity would be zero touching the walls, and as we moved up to the strip next to that, that would have a velocity relative to that zero that would produce a drag force. Now, because we're talking relative velocity between the different layers here, what it means is that the further away you get from the wall, the faster the fluid can be moving because this relative velocity here, um, you want it to keep relatively constant. Obviously, a parabolic profile means that this uh, uh, relative velocity is not precisely constant, but of course what that is offset here is the contact surface area also changes as you move towards the center of the pipe. There, this becomes uh, uh, smaller. So, and the, the drag force is not necessarily constant either. So what you end up with is you end up with a parabolic uh, velocity profile like this um, with the 
liquid in contact with the walls of the pipe stationary and the uh, velocity in the center of the pipe being a maximum. Now, we've actually already seen an example of this, so let's go back to our laminar flow from, of water from a tap and have a look at it again in a little bit more detail. Now, this is the same laminar flow that we've seen before, but what we didn't point out at the time was this is also evidence of viscous flow. If you notice, just where it's coming out of the tap, so up here, the flow narrows as it comes out of the tap. And this is because the core of the fluid, the fluid in the middle of the pipe, is flowing faster than the fluid at the edges, and so therefore it runs out faster and the fluid at the edges is slower, and this is why you get this narrowing of the flow as it comes out of the pipe. It's because water is not an ideal fluid, but a viscous fluid. Now in general, viscous flow is extremely hard to describe mathematically, but there are certain situations where there have been uh, empirical and mathematical solutions uh, to the problem. And the one that we're going to discuss at the moment was in fact the first one that was found in about 1838, uh, well before the Navier-Stokes equations were known, uh, by a French physician uh, called Jean uh, Poiseuil. And what he uh, discovered empirically by measuring it was that um, if you had a pipe, so we've got a long pipe here, and it's full of our fluid that's flowing and so of course we have a low velocity at the edge because it's viscous flow now and a large velocity in the center um, so we have our, uh, our velocity profile due to viscous flow and what he discovered by measurement uh, empirically was that of course there's a pressure drop here because you've got a drag force um, that's acting um, as a, a drag force due to the friction between the layers of fluid that is measured by our viscosity. And what he discovered was that this pressure drop along a long straight circular, has to have a circular pipe um, of radius here R, um, what he discovered was that the pressure drop was equal to 8 times the shear viscosity, this was this eta quantity that we've already discussed, times the length of the pipe. So if we've got this pipe here, it has a length, capital L. So the longer the pipe, the larger the pressure drop, the more the viscosity, the larger the pressure drop, times Q. And so Q is equal to the uh, volume flow rate. Right, so this is measured in cubic meters per second in SI units. And then it's inversely proportional. Well, there's a factor of pi in there because, of course, we've got a circular pipe. But then here's the surprise, is it goes as radius to the fourth power. Right, so this is the radius of the long straight pipe to the fourth power. And so what this means is that even a small narrowing in the radius can have a dramatic effect on the volume flow rate given the same pressure difference. Or, in fact, since it was discovered by a, f a physician, what he was interested in is, um, for example, blood pressure rises preceding heart attacks. And the reason for that is the body tries to keep the volume flow rate the same, but if the artery is narrow by even a small amount, because it goes as radius to the fourth power, the pressure difference has to increase dramatically. And so that actually explains physi the physiology of heart attacks, which is you know, why the blood pressure increases prior to a heart attack. It's because the arteries have narrowed slightly and the body is trying to maintain the same volume flow rate. So let's have a look at the effects of this law in the lab. So now we've seen Pozoil's law, we want to see it in action. And so what we've got here is we've got a long, uh, uh, thin pipe that's filled with water. And at four positions along the pipe, there's a vertical riser that contains water in it. Now what Pozoil's law says is that when we have viscous flow along the pipe at the bottom, there is a pressure drop due to the flow of the viscous fluid. 
in which case, in this case, it's water. So you might think that water isn't very viscous and it, it does have a low viscosity compared to something like honey, but it does not have a zero viscosity. So here you can see when there's no flow that the pressure is equal at all points along the pipe. Well, what I'm going to do now is remove the bung and we'll see what happens to those uh, levels when we have a fluid flow. And so now what you can see is that as it goes along the pipe, the viscosity of the water means that the pressure here is slightly lower than it is in the tank. It drops further here, it drops further here, and it drops further um, at the end. And so that is due to Pozoil's law.